in Amsterdam and Manuscripta. And right next to me is Ruben Cepedes, the author of Between Shades of Grey. The book uh, follows the story of a 15-year-old girl named Lina, who um, is deported with her mother and younger brother to Siberia. And the story chronicles not only Lina's fight to survive, but her struggle to retain faith in mankind, you know, amidst the terror. And I also know that this is a very personal story for you. Could you elaborate on this a little bit? Sure. Um, my grandfather was an officer in the Lithuanian military, and when Stalin pushed into the Baltics, uh, he created lists of those he considered anti-Soviet, and my grandfather being in the military was on that list. And so, to avoid, you know, execution or deportation, he fled, uh, along with my father and my grandmother. And so, my father lived for nine years um, in refugee camps in Germany, and, and amidst other situations in Germany, until he made it to the U.S. It's very much a part of my identity being Lithuanian and I wanted to give voice to the millions of people that were associated with this part of history but hadn't had a chance to talk about it. Were you told stories about this when you were young or did you discover it at a later age? Um, a certain amount of the story I did know because I would hear from my grandparents or from my father some of the memories and things that he experienced. But when I was in Lithuania, I was meeting with relatives and I asked them you know, if they had any photo albums and told them I'd love to see pictures of my father or my grandfather. And the room became pretty quiet and I don't speak Lithuanian, mm -hmm. they were speaking Lithuanian and I knew something was up. And, um, and they said, well Ruta, we don't have any photos because um, apparently you don't know, we, we had to burn them all. Uh, we couldn't let anyone know that we were related to your father, your grandfather. And I was still sort of confused and didn't understand, and I asked them to explain. And then they said that during that time period, people that were related to, to others who were considered anti-Soviet were also targeted. So they were at risk just being related to my grandfather. And so they burned all the photos, and they also explained that some of our family members had been deported to Siberia. And that was the first I had ever heard of it. Did it take very long for you to think about writing a book, or did you immediately think this is something that needs to be told? Well, I, I've always, I always wanted to write a book. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to be a writer. I just never had the courage to really sit down and do it. That seemed like something, I don't know, that was just you know out of my reach, being able to you know to write a book. So um, no, not right away. I knew that that there were pieces that interested me, but what I wanted to do right away was research. Yeah. Um, and then once I started the research, I, I felt, yes, I had to write the book, but then, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? Yeah. How am I going to do this justice? This is such a serious and tragic and story. Yeah, it's quite a topic to tackle. Exactly. And it was pretty overwhelming and a little mm -hmm. bit scary. And there were times that I thought, okay, I've bitten off more than I can chew. I should just quit. And you actually went to some places that must have been very very heavy to deal with. For example, uh, you went to one of the trains. Yeah. Did you actually go inside of the kettle people? I did. They, there is one train car left in Lithuania um, that was an actual car that was used for the deportations. And it was brought to an open-air museum called mm -hmm. Rushiskis, where uh, they have on display different elements throughout Lithuanian history. And at first I thought, oh well, that'll be interesting. I need to be in the train car and I need to see how large it is and what it feels like in there. But I didn't anticipate the feeling that I would get when I walked in. And so I got in and first of all, the train car was so small. And in the book I write, there are 50 or 60 people yes. cramped in this car and you know, in the dark and there's no bathroom. There's just a hole in the floor the size of a plate. But when I was in there, it was really scary and haunting. And just thinking that, you know, so many people were in this car being shuttled to their death um, and in that car for two months, sometimes two and a half months in a train car. Um, and, you know, I asked one of the people that was with me outside, I said, how did they expect people to survive this? Yes. And the woman told me, she's like, Ruta, they didn't expect people to survive. And, and she said they hoped that they, they didn't and then that would make, you know, their process easier. And it was just... Sickening. Oh, okay. Yeah, there are a lot of shocking parts in this book, and this was one of the moments where I really thought like, it's almost impossible. It's, it's a miracle that people survive something like I know. that, even the, that first part. It's a lottery. It's a lottery of yeah. life or death. And I had um, actually, I was doing a school visit recently, and um, a student stood up and he said, um, 
have you read The Hunger Games? And I don't know if The Hunger Games has made it to... Is it? Oh, yes, oh, yes, okay. yes. Okay. Yeah, so, I, I have um, discussed it, and a lot of people that watch my right. videos really love The Hunger Games. Excellent. Okay, so a student stood up, and he, he asked me, though, he said, have you read The Hunger Games? I said, all three, I love them. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, your book is The Hunger Games for real. And I thought, wow. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, if you win, you know, you live. Yeah. You know, and, and losing means death. Um, and I had never thought about it like that in, in a popular sort of a, of a reference. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's heavy. <laughs> During your research, you obviously talked to a lot of people. Did any of the names of people, maybe a family member, end up in the book? Oh, that's, no one's asked me that. That's a really good question. And yes, they did. Not only names, but all of the dates that I use in the mm -hmm. book are, are um, important dates re related to our family. Oh. So those are meaningful. And then um, Jonas, uh, Luna's brother in the book, mm -hmm. which in Lithuanian is pronounced Jonas, but everyone in English pronounces it Jonas. But that's my grandfather's name. Mm -hmm. And to create the character, I tried to imagine what my grandfather would have been like as a little boy. And so that's how I created that character. Well, originally, in the original manuscript, the only character that had a name mm -hmm. was the main character. And throughout the manuscript, I used descriptions instead of names. Mm -hmm. You might remember yes, some of the man who wound his watch, the bald man, the, bald man, the repeater, um, the, the yellow girl. Uh, you know, I, and I, at first, the only person that had a real name was the main character. But then as I went through the manuscript with my editor, she felt it was a little bit confusing, and so I actually did assign um, some names. And the interesting thing is that when I was interviewing survivors and I would ask them to describe someone in the camp, maybe they couldn't remember the name, but they would say, uh, oh, he, was, he would wind his watch and, and rock to calm himself, or they said, oh, there's a man, and he, you know, he stuttered or he repeated his words over and over again. When you were a teenager, mm -hmm. uh, did you read a lot of books? I did. I, I was uh, your classic um, geeky teen who felt really out of place, and so I, I read I, I, everything I could get my hands on. And you know, when you're young, books have the potential to make a tremendous impact yes, on you. And books that you really love when you're, you know, young, they stay with you forever. Whereas, you know, when you're an adult, you might read something, and because you're so preoccupied, you know, and jaded, and bitter. No, and, you know, and so things affect you in a different way, but books I loved, you know, and, and I loved really dark books when I was a teen. Can you give some examples? Oh, Maybe recommend something? Oh, I, what I would recommend, no, don't read what I would recommend, but any, any book that I would recommend, you know, librarians have told me, don't ever recommend that. For example, one of my favorite books as a teen was Ethan Frome, and it's like, it's, it's such a dark book, and um, Wuthering Heights, and, um, oh, yeah. I loved, you know, I loved really dark stories. But on the flip side, you know, I always loved Roald Dahl. Um, so right now you're on a European tour. I am. <laughs> Is this your first time in the Netherlands? No, I, I actually, I've worked in the music business for oh. 20 years. And um, I come here doing, you know, concerts with my various clients. So, but this is the first time here, you know, for my book, which is so, so exciting. This is the Dutch version of the book. Which is great. I love it. <laughs> You've seen it before, obviously. Yes, I love it. Um, what do you think about this cover compared to this one? Do you have any preferences or? Um, well, first let's look at the title. The title of the American book is Between Shades of Grey. And what I intended there was, um, you know, this is such a tragic part of history, but I don't think that we can just make sweeping generalizations, you know, and categorize things in the extremes and say it was, you know, um, good or evil. 100% evil. Exactly. Yes. I think when you peel back the layers, the truth lies somewhere in, the, in you know, the shades of gray. And that's, yeah. and that's what I did find when I interviewed survivors, very much so, that um, not all Soviets were bad. Um, and in the Dutch title, Shadow Love, how do you pronounce it in Dutch? Um, I love the word shadow. Mm -hmm. I think it, it, it really represents um, the experience of the victims, they were telling me that, you know, Stalin, just, just just the name and the presence hung over them like a cold shadow long after he had passed away. And then other people told me that um, in order to survive, they learned to live in, not, not the shadows, but live in a shadow. They learned how to um, uh, become very still inside to escape the terror that they were experiencing. So I love the, I love the title. And um, in the, uh, on the American cover, they have barbed wire. We were trying to balance hope and horror. Um, 
with the, the American cover. So we have the, the barbed wire that represents the you know horror yeah. and the horrific experience. But then you're looking through it to see, you know, uh, something blooming yeah. in the Arctic snow, which is near impossible, and that represents you know the, the survival. Um, and, and here the same thing. I think we see the drama uh, of the barbed wire, the shadow yeah. of you know of the barbed wire um, going over her face, which I look at it. it you know, that division is representing yeah, good that's and evil. And, yeah. um, I'm so grateful. The book is sold in 27 countries. I was going to ask that. Yeah, that is, that and is so amazing. There's these different cover interpretations, and I love getting them. I get so excited, and they're all great and really insightful. And some of the other titles are, um, the German title is um, The Invincible Summer Inside of Me, which I think is really, it's oh, really beautiful. Yeah, that's very um, nice and in um, Italian, the title is uh, they even turned off the moon. In France, the title is um, What They Couldn't Take From Us, or That, The Only Thing They Couldn't Take mm -hmm. From Us. It's like that. So it's really Yeah, nice. it's all very, it's, yeah, cool. it's very, I mean, it matches, but it's still very different. Yeah, it's great. Exactly. So what are your next stops on the tour? I'll run, this, I'll run it quickly, because I'll, if, I, if I don't, then I, I forget the order. It's um, Sweden. <laughs> okay, wait. I started in Denmark, and then Sweden, uh, Holland, Poland, France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Germany, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, the UK, uh, Belgium, and the rest of the schedule is still coming in. So. Okay, okay. <laughs> so are you very excited about going to Lithuania? And it's probably very different from talking to people here about well, the book. And it's it's a very I'm very humble because imagine here I am an American, and I don't speak Lithuanian. Uh, my mother's American, mm -hmm. so here I am, an American, and I wrote this book, and it's almost like, here, I'm telling your story. That's a very odd feeling. I, I really have a re reverence and, and a respect about that. I'm aware that this is their story. Yeah. I mean, imagine, I, I think of, you know, I live in Tennessee, and what if a Lithuanian person who didn't speak English wrote about Tennessee's role in the Civil War? I'd probably think, what? <laughs> Do you think there's a, a difference in the way that the book is received uh, in America uh, as opposed to Europe? Oh, wow. Um, I would say that, um, again, I don't want to make any sweeping generalizations, <laughs> but I find that Europeans have a much broader knowledge of um, world history. Mm -hmm. And so while many Americans um, were shocked you know, that this had ever happened, um, many of the Europeans had you know, they know somewhat about, you know, Stalin's role and, and you know, that it's estimated that he killed over 20 million people. Um, so if anything, I, I find that maybe there's some knowledge there, whereas maybe in America it's more of a shock. More of a surprise. Yeah, that is what I discovered when I went online and read reviews uh -huh. from teenagers. A lot of them were extremely surprised. Like, I did not, and I have to admit, I did not know like right. the extent of the story either. I but, didn't, and it yeah. affected my family, so don't you know, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so finally, um, the question is uh, whether you're writing a new book. I just finished another book. Really? I did, I just finished another book, and I haven't turned it into my publisher yet, but they know, they saw the first 100 pages and said, okay, go for it. Um, and I, I just finished that, and uh, it's historical, but it's, you know, it's set in a totally different time period. It's set in New Orleans in 1950. And uh, it's about the daughter of a New Orleans prostitute who is really gifted and talented. And despite, you know, the family that she's born into and society's opinion of her, um, she decides to apply to a very prestigious uh, university in 1950. Wow. Um, and so it's sort of a story about uh, someone who has the courage to try to fly when they're born with broken wings, you know, and how that happens. So. Okay, well, that sounds very exciting. I'm it's very so different. But well, oh, it's, 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 it's definitely different, and I had to go to New Orleans, you know, I went four times and, and immersed myself. You know, for this book, I was going to Soviet prisons, and in this one, I was immersing myself in brothel culture and prostitutes and <laughs> gangsters, and uh, so it's very different, but I'm, I'm super excited about it. But, you know, the jury's still out. I have to see what my publisher thinks okay. about it. <laughs> we'll see how it ends up. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye.